Hello, and welcome to our conversations with our cybersecurity partner, Arctic Wolf. I'm Alex Raven, CMO of CoolSpirit, and I welcome along with me today, Rich Fenton, Senior Pre-Sales Engineer at Arctic Wolf. How are you doing, Rich? You okay? I'm good, thanks, Alex. Yeah, good, good. Thanks for your time today. During the next 10 minutes, we'll be discussing how you can build security operations, detect when threat acts are present in your environment, and how you to respond, protecting your business and your data. So I'll get started, if that's okay, with the first question, Rich. The cybersecurity industry seems to be a sea of acronyms ending in DR. Where does uh, MDR fit in? Um, well, there's lots of buzzwords, and these acronyms and buzzwords really come out of the way products and services have evolved from vendors to really pigeonhole and aggregate what they actually do and what value they provide to the market. So obviously, we started with endpoint protection and antivirus, and then the ability to aggregate those is pretty much where the EDR acronym came from. So the endpoint vendors being able to aggregate their endpoint technologies and manage them centrally. That's effectively where EDR came in. And of course, you could then outsource that. So that's effectively where the, the M of MDR came in is, is outsourcing the management of your endpoint um, detection um, capability and response capability. So it's um, providing that expertise. And of course, endpoint is really just a very small area of the attack surface. Um, actually, we did a study last year that looked at all the observations that led to us ticketing our customers with incidents, you know, detecting something and then us taking a ticket and, and providing a remediation action. And actually, when we looked at all of our ticketed incidents last year, only 15% of the incidents related to the endpoints or stemmed from the endpoint. You've got to think about the network, the firewall, infrastructure as a service, the cloud, um, um, the cloud services, identity management, the human risk, the external vulnerabilities, which is where a lot of the, um, uh, uh, the, the vulnerabilities are. So given this wide view of the environment, not just the endpoint, it's kind of where XDR came from, because XDR is really doing that detection response, but doing it beyond more than just the endpoint. Um, so XDR really federates your telemetry and this is probably one of the critical differences between what Arctic Wolf do and what a typical XDR platform will do. An XDR platform will federate your tel telemetry from multiple sources and get it into one place. But actually, security operations is a much bigger picture. It's not just about the endpoint or the network or the cloud or the people or the process. It's a combination of all of those things. So it's piecing together that jigsaw puzzle prioritizing them for your unique needs and, and, and then productionize that so it becomes a discipline. And it's this capability, this um, security expertise, this discipline, this process, which is what we call security operations. And we provide our customers with access to that security expertise. And for the vast majority of customers, this isn't core competency for them. They don't have a security team that's, uh, that, that, that's looking and, and, and living and breathing this all the time, 24 by seven. Um, this is the the, uh, the ability for us to not only ingest, analyze, and remediate and take affirmative action, but then providing the skills and resources to be able to determine what, what you need to do in the, in the event of a breach and the uh, detection and response capability. That's exactly what Arctic Wolf do. It's a security operations focus that's focused on the outcome, as opposed to yet another tool that's just going to aggregate your data and require you to do that work. And I guess from what you're saying there, I guess it, you know, if a company was to look at Arctic Wolf or consider deploying the technology in your support, it's far faster to get up and running than employing their own team to do this. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, to think about, you know, doing it this yourself and build, building a DIY model, DIY model. Well, first of all, you've got to attract those employees. You've got to hire them and then you've got to retain them and then you've got to train them. That's really, really difficult. And of course, if you're trying to do this 24 by 7, Gartner will tell you you need about eight to 12 security analysts just to cover shift work, to cover um, um, holidays and sickness. And again, to do that takes time, it takes effort. It's probably not the customer's core capability. They're there to be a retail manufacturer or provide services to end, end users as opposed to building a security operations center. So not only building it, but maintaining it, it's much easier to effectively subscribe to a service and then we can onboard customers typically within 30 days to get them live within the service. So they go from a laggard to having a leadership capability in cybersecurity in a very short space of time. Well, that sounds great. I guess, I guess a word that's banned around around uh, a bad word that's banned around a lot is ransomware. How does it how does it help customers keep safe from that? Just for example. 
Yeah, so ransomware is constantly evolving. And I think we're preconditioned to think that it's really related to the endpoint. So going back to that XDR point, you know, you can focus on the endpoint. That's obviously where there's a lot of risk or there's certainly an element of risk. But getting that very wide picture of your entire attack surface, whether that's the endpoint, whether that's a network, whether that's identity, whether that's cloud, really you want to be able to get as much visibility as you possibly can. And what we see is that there's a number of trends that we see in the industry. So the rise of zero day vulnerabilities, it's not just nation states that are, that are targeting zero day vulnerabilities. Um, we acquired a incident response company called Tetra Defense um, earlier this year, around February timeframe. And we just published um, uh, a, an interesting study ar around when they get involved into the incident response where, where customers have been breached and, and they're almost a Winston Woolful out of Pulp Fiction that turn up and, and deal with those incidents, 82% of those incidents start with um, effectively the hackers taking um, some uh, exploit of a zero day vulnerability and, and actually um, using those. So those are, tend to be the, 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 the routes in. And actually those um, zero day vulnerabilities, they tend to be more costly to recover from. So our studies found that 54% um, uh, more cost to be able to recover from an exploit from, the, from a, a zero day vulnerability as opposed to a, a, you know, a, a, a regular breach that's come through a, a malicious document. And of course, that attack surface is constantly changing. So you have supply chain attacks. We saw that with SolarWinds. We saw it earlier this year with Okta where it's actually the supplier of the software that's being hacked. And then that's obviously bit, uh, making its way into the environment. We also see not only ransomware, but there's also a damp, double, double uh, whammy of um, ransomware and then data exfiltration. Um, it was a really interesting study um, when one of the Conti groups as part of the Ukraine conflict defected and published a lot of the um, public um, chat sessions on, on, the, uh, on the internet using our threat intelligence and going through those those um, uh, th those chat sessions, 60 odd thousand messages, we're able to see links between Conti Group and Karakurt. So not only will you get ransomware by Conti Group, but then a um, an affiliated um, Karakurt um, organization will come in after the fact and use the same infrastructure to, to provide data exfiltration. So it's almost a, a double whammy of being hit, hit twice. And of course, there's still the detection and response and the education of things like spear phishing and social engineering for that initial breach. Again, 54% of uh, attacks happen with malicious documents. 23% um, are user credentials that are published on the dark web and then being brute forced or um, reuse of uh, user credentials. So getting a wide view of um, what the attack surface is and then being able to monitor to detect because you might not know all the zero day vulnerabilities that they're using. You might not see that a user has been breached or, a, um, uh, or has been successfully social engineered. So it's really important to be able to manage and detect and then ultimately take response when you uh, when you see one of these things. And again, that's exactly what we do as a service. And do, just on that, do your team also advise if a company deploys your technology and you're monitoring their environment, do you also give them heads up on other big events that are happening so then they can research that a little bit and just see if it does affect them or not yeah and, and again that's really the crystallization of, of, of the things we do is to develop, provide that proactive um, um, capability that proactive awareness so if there's a large what we call them is industry mega events so the octa breach that i mentioned earlier um, mm -hmm. um, we took a look at things like log 4j um, uh, spring 4 shell events that are going to cause wide disruption or have the potential to cause wide disruption across multiple customers, um, our threat intelligence teams will be monitoring those. And then when we see those types of events, we'll be issuing security bulletins proactively to make customers aware, here's what's happened, here's what the potential impact is, and most importantly, here's how you protect yourselves. And sometimes we issue several, uh, several bulletins, so Log4j, we had an initial bulletin that went out when, when it was initially announced just before Christmas. We then created a script and uh, a tool to be able to do um, uh, to be able to do discovery work, made that publicly available. So we might actually issue for a for a, for a large uh, mega threat. We might actually issue um, several bulletins to keep our customers up, updated and aware. But what's most important is that it's not the customers requirement to be able to do this education and to be able to do this analysis themselves we're providing them on a proactive level um, by ways of security bulletins or or focus bulletins if we see vulnerabilities with the firewalls that they use for instance and again having this global picture of 
three and a half thousand customers that are on the system, that allows us to be able to use the threat intelligence that we see and, and, and the escalations that we're providing. So that if we see an event in a customer in the US, we can fingerprint, we can triage, we can run that through the pipeline and then see which other customers are vulnerable or affected. And again, be able to be, provide proactive um, uh, um, proactive um, security bulletins and, and proactive awareness for those customers as well. Cool. Really appreciate it. See once fix for all is a good good term that I use to describe that capability. Yeah, really appreciate time and the insight on this. I guess one last question: how how is this all operationalized? And and I guess we, you know we, we've discussed about you know you don't need a security team you know to deploy this, but what if your customers have got a security team? Does that affect the the usage of those guys? How does that work? Yeah, it's really important to understand that this isn't an outsourcing model. We're not there to replace the customer's security team. We're there to augment their security team and provide them with that deep security expertise and that deep guidance. So I determine it as a, a cooperative shared security model. The customer still focuses on their resources, on their strategy and the implementation of the, the remediation uh, actions that we provide. They're the ones that have got hands on keyboards. They're the ones that, that understand the change control that's happening within their environment. And ultimately, the customer's risk has to, you know, the, the management of the customer's risk and the customer's strategy has to reside with the customer. They, they know best. They know what their strategy is and their business objectives are best. What we do is we supplement them with that operationalization capability and that deep expertise. So while, rather than the customer having to build those resources to, to do the heavy lifting element of this, 24 by 7 monitoring, the deep remediation and guidance, the threat analytic, analytics and the threat hunting, we provide that capability. And every customer that comes on board gets aligned to two security experts that are there for them to be able to engage with, to be able to provide that strategic guidance, that there's no limitations on them to be able to engage with. So understand what we do in the event of an attack. How do we respond from a technical and a process perspective? And then also test them, you know, your backup and restore process. It's your platform that's truly immutable. How long will it take to do a restore and order the process? You know, I know CoolSpit has some fantastic partners and services in this area. So it's been able to provide that whole um, landscape of posture review and, um, you know, uh, what your, uh, what your uh, uh, overall um, pop, pop the security posture is and consistently improve this over a period of time. Right. Thank you very much. That's been great, really insightful. And uh, yeah, I'll speak to you next time. Thank you very much. Excellent. Cheers, Alex. Cheers.